jumped into the last unit of the class, but I guess it's um, this extended kind of advanced method unit that Javier and I are going to switch off teaching some, some lectures on. You know, maybe interesting, relevant, uh, more modern um, optimization methods. And most of what we're going to be doing from now on, the course is based on algorithms. So we'll see some kind of theory here and there, but most of it is based on algorithms. Um, so I'm going to talk today about the proximal newt method, which you know, in and of itself is actually not that new, but um, it's it's uh, used very frequently in some, uh, let's say, optimization problems that appear commonly in, in machine learning and statistics, and it, it achieves pretty close to state of the art for some of those problems. So I will um, I'll try to give some informal details about how those things are implemented uh, in, in such a way that they achieve state of the art, and then we'll just talk about um, proximal newt method in, in general. Okay, it's also a nice follow-up to the second order method uh, unit that we just finished. So last time, um, Javier gave a, a very nice lecture on quasi-Newton methods. Um, and here's just a very kind of brief summary. So we're looking at the, you know, unconstrained smooth optimization, where our, our criterion we're assuming, is, let's say, is convex and twice differentiable, full domain. In the generic form of a quasi-Newton method, and I'm sorry that I, I switch notation of it from the last lecture because this lecture I'm also going to be using H. So I just didn't want to um, have H appear twice. And the slides can mean different things. But basically the generic form of a quasi-Newton method is as follows. We, um, we take a uh, step in the direction, some matrix times our previous iterate, where this matrix, calling M, superscript K minus 1, it approximates right, the inverse of the Hessian of F at the point X K minus 1. Okay, and the step prices are usually chosen by backtracking. So the key uh, behind these quasi newton methods is that um, M0 is easily computed. So the very first step that's very easy to do. And MK minus 1, this actually is a typo. So let's say MK is easily updated from MK K minus 1. Okay, that's this another key. So once we have this approximation to the inverse Hessian at step k minus 1, it's easy to get that approximation at step k. Easily updated. Or, yeah, we could say easily updated from mk minus Okay, or maybe in the slides it makes more sense to say mk minus 1 is easily updated from mk minus 2. But you get the picture. Okay, and there are many ways to do that. Um, this was perhaps the most acronyms that we've seen in one lecture. Um, but these are all really cool methods. Um, kind of as an anecdote, personal anecdote, I remember taking a, a class on optimization in graduate school and there was a lecture on quasi-Newton methods. And we just had learned conjugate gradients. So we had a ton of acronyms floating around. And any one time the teacher would ask a, you know, us to suggest a method for a problem, and if you just yelled out some combination of these letters, they're usually pretty close to right. So, uh, SR1 is uh, the symmetric rank 1 update that we learned very first, uh, very first one, and it uses the sherman morse woodbury formula for the inverse to get the approximation of the inverse Hessian. And then uh, DFP and BFGS use rank 2 updates, and they just, they differ in somehow um, how they treat the Hessian and the inverse Hessian. So BFGS is almost like the near opposite of DFP in terms of the roles of the Hessian and the inverse Hessian. And uh, once you kind of nail that down, you again just use Sherman, Morse, and Whitbury to get the update for the, the inverse, or the original matrix, depending on which one you're looking at. And LBFGS is the limited memory version that we didn't cover in, in uh, like a ton of detail in class, but the, the slides have all the details that you need, and you're going to, I believe, on the next homework, we're going to have you implement LBFGS uh, so that you'll get to kind of familiarize yourself more with that. And uh, I think it's fair to say, Javier, that this is by far the most popular quasi method, the LPFGS. So you'll see this being used kind of really quite frequently if you look in the right literature. All right, so that was quasi newton methods. So today we're going to talk about something that's very related to second-order methods, um, and it's the proximal Newton method. Uh, it's like the marriage of the idea of proximal gradient with the second-order method. Um, and we'll go through the usual stuff, like talk about backtracking, conversion analysis. I'll give you some notable examples of, of where this is used um, in some common problems, optimization problems that we encounter often in statistics and machine learning. And then if we have time, I'll talk about projected Newton, which is actually different than proximal Newton. It's not a special case of 
of uh, proximal gradient. So unlike projective gradient, which is a special case of proximal gradient, projective gradient is actually a completely different creature. It's just a different algorithm. So we'll, uh, if we have time, we'll get there. OK, so just a reminder, uh, the maybe like the fourth, I don't know, I don't know, maybe the third or fourth week of class, we talked about proximal gradient, which operates on a problem like this, um, where the criterion is, is a composite form. It's some uh, function g plus another function h, where both are convex. g is smooth, and h is what we call simple. I mean, all that we mean by that is that we know it's a proximal operator, okay, that we can evaluate. Usually, we think about the cases in which we can evaluate this actually analytically, or close to analytically. Okay, the proximal operator is just the, the minimizer of um, the criterion uh, 1 over 2t times the square distance between x and z plus h of z. So z is the optimization variable. Given an input x, the proximal operator evaluated at x is the minimizer uh, to this convex program. Okay, and so proximal gradient basically repeated the following steps. We just took gradient steps with respect to g, so you can interpret it in this way. Take a gradient step with respect to g, so this is if you're only minimizing g, this is where you would be told to go, right, by gradient descent, and then you apply the proximal operator of h. And you do that repeatedly, where tk is the step time. Okay, so just to recap some high level points, the difficulty of the iterations here is in applying the props, in the sense that uh, if G is complicated but smooth, it doesn't really complicate in any way, uh, at least conceptually, how hard these iterations are. Right? If we can compute the gradient of G, then really the, the conceptual difficulty associated with proximal gradient depends entirely on H. Because this proximal operator is only being evaluated at this point. This is a constant with respect to this minimization problem. Right? It's just the gradient step with respect to G. That plays the role of x in this minimization problem, we minimize over z. So only really the form of h affects how, how hard or how easy that is. And we also saw that proximal gradient, I think, if I'm remembering it properly, you actually proved this on one of the homeworks. It enjoys the, the same convergence rate as, as gradient descent. Okay, and, and by rate we mean the number of iterations required, say, to get the, an epsilon to optimal solution under standard conditions is like on the order of 1 over epsilon which is the same as gradient descent. Okay, but the difference here is that each iteration actually applies to the prox rather than just taking the gradient step. Okay, so it's useful when the prox is efficient because if the prox is like roughly as, as uh, let's say, costly as just taking a gradient step, then it's actually, we're in kind of a very good situation because we're, we're converging at, at a rate as if we were just minimizing a smooth function, but we actually can handle, you know, a composite function, smooth plus constant. Any questions about prox gradient before we move on? It's kind of important we just get that uh, that recap behind us. Okay, so let's let's think about the motivation for prox gradient, right? The motivation, if you recall, actually came from gradient descent um, because we, we saw that we could even use view gradient descent in terms of uh, taking local quadratic approximations. So the idea is, let's suppose we're at some point called x k minus one, and this is our function. The idea behind gradient descent is to take a local quadratic approximation to our function, okay, and then minimize this, this local quadratic approximation, and that will bring us to the next point, which will be xk, and then we'll go ahead and we'll make another quadratic approximation, etc. We'll minimize that, and that's how we'll proceed. And what was special about this quadratic approximation is that its curvature, okay, its curvature was dictated by 1 over t times the identity. That was really the matrix that dictated the curvature that dictated the curvature um, in this quadratic approximation. Okay, in the sense that um, just ignore the rule of H here. If we were just minimizing G, we would replace, say, G at a point Z by its quadratic approximation about X, which is just given by this usual linear gradient term plus one of our 2t times the square distance between z and x, but we can think of that term as z minus x transpose 1 over t times identity times z minus x, I guess times the leading half. So the point is that uh, if we were thinking about this as a quadratic, the, the matrix that dictates the curvature is just this really simple spherical um, 
a really simple spherical curvature matrix, 1 over t times identity. And this made it so that it was actually quite easy to optimize this local quadratic, which makes great that have this nice close form, right? x minus t times the grad of, of g. And for proximal gradient, remember the motivation was actually to repeat this kind of idea, but uh, just leaving h in place the whole time. So at any given point x, if we want to kind of figure out where to move next, we're going to make a, a local quadratic approximation to g with cur with the i over t times the, sorry, 1 over t times the identity being the curvature matrix. That's this guy here. And we're going to keep h as is because it's not smooth, so we really don't know what to do with it in terms of, let's say, quadratic expansion. And we can just very easily re rewrite that in the following way. Okay, if you were to expand this out, you'd see that actually this is equal to these terms, uh, modulo some things that don't depend on z, right? Um, just think about taking the inner product of x minus z with this term, that gives you this, and then the, the square term for x minus z appears here, and the only other term that's left over is the square term of this, but that doesn't depend on z, so we can just forget about it. Okay, so the idea of making a quadratic approximation to g, leaving h untouched, leads us to this. But this is exactly just applying the prox operator of h to the gradient step with respect to g. That's just the definition, right, of the prox operator evaluated at this point, x minus t times g. So that was the idea behind proximal gradient. And after that, we, we learned a bunch of stuff about second order methods, and we spent some time studying Newton's method. And a fundamental difference between Newton's method and gradient descent was that as opposed to using something like this when we do local quadratic approximations, Newton's method actually uses, right, this is the gradient descent choice for curvature, this thing. Newton's method actually uses the local Hessian. Okay, so it uses actually the, the, the curvature of the Hessian itself in the quadratic approximation. Okay, um, so that was the fundamental difference between Newton's method and gradient descent, and we saw that as a result we could get much faster conversions with Newton's method at the cost of more expensive iterations. So now you might, you know, come back to this idea of proximal gradient and just ask the question: What happens if we replace, uh, you know, this simple kind of i over one over t times identity here with with the Hessian, the local Hessian of g? What would that give us? That actually gives us proximal Newton. Okay, so it's, it's kind of the very natural um, marriage of proximal gradient with Newton's method. Um, but we, we kind of set it up in a slightly different way. So here's the proximal Newton method. Um, starting with um, you know, some initial point, we're going to repeat the following iterations. First, let's just find the direction called V to move in. Okay, so that's standing for, let's say, um, z minus x in this problem. And it's given by uh, taking a quadratic approximation to g about the point x minus 1, where we actually use the Hessian of g at x k minus 1 itself in this quadratic form. OK, and, and uh, remember, v is, is the direction that we seek to move in, so we're actually going to be evaluating the, uh, the non-smooth term at x k minus 1 plus v, because that would be the new iterate that we end up at. Okay, that plays the role of h of z in this form. Okay, so first find the direction that looks best according to a quadratic approximation of g plus h. It's just, the, it's just that that quadratic approximation is kind of more sophisticated, uses the actual Hessian. And then take a step in that direction, but do some step-by-step optimization. Right, so the pure proximal Newton would actually just take tk equals 1, but then we would, you know, most usually do some kind of step-by-step optimization. This is a very old idea, it's at least as old as proximal gradient, and it goes by many other names. In statistics, we actually call this uh, local scoring. Okay, so if you've seen, like, um, if you've taken a class on max length of optimization, um, this is go by the name of local scoring, for example. Okay, um, so equivalently, we can write this either in terms of the directions or in terms of the next iterative itself. This is just a rearrangement, okay? There's nothing kind of fancy going on here. Here I'm just saying that we can also think about optimizing for some surrogate point called z which is um, where we would move next if we were to take a pure proximal step. Okay, just by doing the same quadratic approximation of g plus h uh, minimization. And then instead of moving kind of entirely to z, we just move part of the way there. 
against the revenue kind of stuff that we wish. Just to rewrite it approximately. Okay, so to put this in a notation that's similar to uh, proximal gradient descent, we're going to define something called the scaled proximal map. Okay, so it's going to be uh, in a, a kind of a strict generalization of what we already saw with proximal map, uh, but it's, it's going to be using a different norm than the usual L2 norm. It's going to be using a norm induced by a positive semi-definite matrix H, which is the Hessian. So let's, let's think about um, defining the following mapping. So at any point x, okay, we're going to look at a minimization problem over z that looks very similar to what we, what we saw with the usual proximal map. It's just that actually instead of the 2 norm here, we're going to use the h norm. And the h norm is defined by, at a vector, say x, the squared h norm is just x transpose hx. We call it the scaled proximal map. So if we were to take h to be this, like I said, this kind of simple um, spherical uh, matrix 1 over t times identity, you can see that we actually get back the usual definition of the proximal operator. Right? This term is because it becomes 1 over 2t times x minus z, the 2 norm squared. But uh, when h is not you know, some multiple of identity, then we get something different, and it's called the scale of proximal map. Uh, this actually shares many of the nice properties of the usual props that we already learned. Um, for example, uniqueness. So I, I'm, I assert that when H is PSD, the, um, the proximal map is actually well defined because the minimizer is unique. So why is that true? It's because this is actually a strictly convex, convex optimization problem. It's a strictly convex optimization problem, right? Because when H is PSD, then this is strictly convex, and we're assuming this is, you know, plain convex. Okay, so it's, it's still a well-defined operator, and it's also like like the um, usual proximal map. It's non-expansive in the usual in the, in the kind of appropriate sense, which means you can think about this as generalizing a projection operator. Okay, so projection operators are non-expansive. Um, I can't remember if we actually talked about that. For convex um, sets, you can kind of see that very naturally. So for convex sets, okay, if I were to take um, let's say two points x and y, and I were to project them onto, a, like say, a set C, call this you know, the projection of x, and call this one the projection of y, then uh, the projection operator for a convex set is non-expansive, which means that the distance between projected points, okay, this is actually less than or equal to the distance between the original points. That's called numbers. In other words, it's Lipschitz with constant 1. So that's true of convex sets. It's not true of non-convex sets. You can draw yourself a picture. Just think about a counter example um, when C is not convex. So proximal, the usual proximal operator actually also satisfies this property. If I took the prox at x and the prox at y, it's also non-expansive. It's Lipschitz with constant 1. That's actually a really nice kind of um, property of the proximal operator. It's used often when we prove things about proximal gradient or proximal operators. And you can think about it like generalizing a projection. Not only for that reason, but also because when you have a convex set, the proximal operator associated with the indicator is the projection, something we've also seen. And the scale of prox is actually also non-expansive in the appropriate sense. Okay, we have to use the age norm to define non-expansiveness. Okay, so this is also a very useful property, and it's useful when we prove things about proximal gradient. So a lot of these facts about proximal operators they actually carry over to this, this thing. And I, I reference a paper in the, at the end of the slide that you can take a look at if you want to see some of these things thought out in detail. But for now, we can just think about it as you know, some nice notation. And uh, think about what happens then if we make a, say, quadratic approximation to G around the point um, X. Right? We, we seek to minimize that again. We can think of that, this is a very nice kind of feature of this notation, we can think of that in a very intuitive way, which is um, take a Newton step with respect to G at the point X, and then apply the scale proximal operator of H. Okay, so why are these two things the same? Again, just expand this out. <laughs> it's expand this out using the definition of the H norm, and you'll see that actually you get these two terms. So the, the inner product of x minus z transpose h uh, times this, right, gives us this term. And uh, x minus z transpose 
Um, H times itself gives us this term. And then the square term from this, we don't care about because it doesn't depend on Z. Okay, so that, that's why these two things are the same, just by expanding this. And so we can think about it in a very nice way, right? Which is, if we were to think about um, Prox and Newton in terms of this scaled Prox operator, it says, take a Newton step with respect to, to G. So this is what we would do if uh, we didn't have any non-smooth part at all in our criterion. And then apply the scaled proximal mapping of H, right, defined with respect to this, this Hessian, this local Hessian, and move in that direction. Okay, so the pure proximal Newton would take TK equals 1, so that that means this would be the update itself. Otherwise, we just kind of move part of the way there. Okay, so just some remarks. Um, when H is 0, we get back the usual Newton update. Right, because when h is zero, uh, the minimizer here is just the Newton step itself. So the proximal map is the identity. Okay, so we get back Newton's method. If we were to replace h by, I called it one over r k times the identity, just to not to confuse somehow this with what we approximate the Hessian by. Now we were to look at a pure proximal Newton step. So we were to set, set t k equals one we get back the proximal gradient with the step size rk. Okay, so if we ever replace this by one of our key times identity, and we take a full step, we get back the proximal gradient. Okay, so we see that actually proximal Newton kind of generalizes Newton's method, it generalizes uh, gradient descent. But, it, but in general, if we're going to be using hk as the local Hessian of g, it actually has very different properties than does proximal gradient. Okay, so th and this is maybe the most important one. Well, okay, it's, a, it's an important one. We'll see lots of other important properties. Um, the difficulty of the prox operator, it uh, depends both on H and G, unlike um, prox operator. Okay, it depends on H, obviously, because if H is some complicated non smooth function, this could be a hard thing to minimize. But it also depends on G through this Hessian. Okay, so if this Hessian was, let's say, diagonal. It's a much, much easier problem in general than the Hessian was dense. So the structure of the Hessian of G plays a very big role in terms of how difficult this problem operator is. Again, if, if G, let, let's say, admitted a banded Hessian, the Hessian made it with banded, just generally speaking, this is going to be an, an easier um, scaled prox operator to evaluate than if H was dense. Okay, so no longer can we think about somehow G as not mattering at all. So G does matter here in terms of how difficult it is to evaluate the scaled cross. Any questions about that? Okay. So, let's see, I'll give you a bit of details on backtracking. So there, there are many schemes for doing backtracking in proximal Newton. I think actually they're somehow much less unified than they are for, um, like say, Newton's method of proximal gradient. Uh, mostly because, um, as we'll kind of emphasize a bit later, this is typically a very hard thing to evaluate, this scaled prox operator. Okay, it's not at all easy to evaluate this, so there are various variants of backtracking that uh, try to make it kind of, um, they, they try to make the case that you seek to avoid evaluating this as often as possible. So I, I just chose one that I thought was kind of simple, that uh, comes from a fairly recent paper that has some nice kind of convergence properties associated with it, but this is by no means the only one. There's many different ways to do backtracking. Um, so you, as usual, we fix two parameters called an alpha and beta, and we're going to let this be the update direction. So the idea behind this particular variant of backtracking is you only ever evaluate the scaled prox once. So I never have to um, evaluate this scaled prox more than once. So I just uh, think about taking, let's say, a full Newton step in some sense, right? Um, doing pure proximal Newton and, and looking in that direction. So it's the proximal operator at the Newton update minus x. And then I, I'm going to start with uh, t equals 1 and look at uh, some kind of sufficient descent criterion until it's met. And otherwise, I'll shrink the step size, but I'm not going to recompute the direction. I'll just let v be the original direction and, uh, and we kind of just. Uh, compare the two sides of this criterion again. Okay, so this says um, kind of the usual thing, um, which is that we seek to uh, be within, let's say, a factor alpha of a linear approximation 
around the point x to our function. But uh, because h is non-smooth, we just use like its discrete derivative or its discrete difference rather than its actual derivative. Right? If if uh, if this were a gradient descent, we actually have grad f here. If f is smooth here, remember f is g plus h. So we use grad g, but we actually use something like the discrete derivative of uh, h because it's non-smooth in place of grad h, because that wouldn't make sense. Okay, so we just check this criterion. Uh, and when it's met, we exit and, and take that step size. Otherwise, we continue to, to shrink the step size. Okay, so um, it's pretty simple, and it's actually uh, pretty cheap because you only have to have to build the field box ones. Yeah, question. <coughs> what is d then? In the That's just a typo. Sorry, I, I was supposed to be v. Now you kind of at least know the components surrounding proximal Newton, but we haven't really talked about um, say when it's useful. So we'll focus on that for a little bit. So a very high level picture, let's think about um, a problem of this form, right? Minimize g of x plus h of x. We have proximal gradient and proximal Newton that we've learned um, that appear somewhat similar, um, but they actually do pretty different things. Proximal gradient essentially reduces to minimizing it reduces this problem to a series of problems of this form. Okay, just for different choices of B. Um, and I guess different weightings really of this whole first term across iterations. Okay, so we reduce a problem like this to one in which we have a very simple spherical quadratic in X plus H of X to iteratively minimize over and over again. Um, this is called the props operator, the, minima the minimizer of this. Uh, it's often known in closed form. That, I mean, often meaning when we go to apply a proximal gradient, we often do it in cases in which the prox is, uh, is known in closed form. Iterations we think of typically as being cheap. Yeah, at least, again, that's when we would apply proximal gradient when that's true. And it has the same convergence as gradient descent in terms of, let's say, per iteration uh, progress. How many iterations do we need to get to, let's say, a 1 over epsilon? Well, an epsilon is the suboptimal solution. Proximal Newton, instead of, uh, instead of iteratively minimizing things of this form, we, okay, another type, oh, I'm sorry, that's supposed to say proximal Newton iteratively minimize, um, I meant to say, of course, this quadratic. plus h of x. Okay, of course, this is a important. So we produce an iterative approximation to the criterion of this form, where for a general problem, a will be dense. Nothing special about a. Um, we almost never know the proximal closed form. In fact, I, don't, I can't think of a single situation in which people apply proximal Newton. I mean, maybe. Uh, kind of looking past something simple, but I can't think of a situation in which people apply proximal Newton for kind of modern problems in which the prox is on closed form. Okay, it's always treated like an inner optimization problem. Minimizing this. Iterations are very, very expensive. So I put two variables because they're, they're even more expensive than Newton iterations. I mean, they're, they're right, a Newton iteration would just be to do this, to minimize this. Here we have to do this. We have to minimize something like a fully dense um, quadratic form plus a non-smooth form. Okay, so a whole other level of expensiveness compared to Newton even, each iteration. And we're going to see how the convergence of Newton method. So in order to get to an epsilon suboptimal, suboptimal solution, we have a local quadratic rate of convergence. So log log 1 over epsilon iterations of proximal Newton are needed. Okay, so um, maybe the thing to keep in mind is that proximal Newton is not something like just like proximal gradient. We think about somehow applying and every other proximal operator of H just kind of no matter what G is because it's a generic useful method with cheap iterations. It's actually pretty much exclusively used when we have some idea of how to uh, optimize the scale across very efficiently, and it's done with great care. Okay, because we're not actually evaluating that process exactly, we have to evaluate a high enough accuracy that we'll get convergence. 
eventually. Okay, I think I'll also in the notes just state a result for conversions um, when we have inexact box evaluations, which is almost always the case, or like I said, pretty much always the case when we apply box maneuvering, because we're not actually evaluating the box, we're running some iterative optimization procedure each time in order to estimate, in order to kind of get close to the minimized surface. Okay, so a common kind of uh, thing that's used is that as one of the inner optimizers is core descent. We often, you'll see people applying um, proximal Newton and using core descent on the uh, inner problem um, when, when this H function is what we call separable. Um, and, and this G function here is, is let's say, not a quadratic. So uh, I think when Javier covers core descent, he'll kind of define what separable means. But um, that's often a kind of combo that's used with proximal Newton. So let's, uh, let's look at the convergence rate. Um, and this is, uh, this is, I think, kind of an old result. Um, but I, I found a very nice recent paper that gave a very thorough treatment of proximal Newton <coughs> across many cases. Okay, and this was kind of like the most basic uh, situation to look at. Um, and one nice thing about this result is that I actually think that the proof of this result in this paper is easier than the Boyd and Vandenberg proof of the convergence of Newton's method. So if you want to see how, if you want to see a proof for the convergence of Newton's method, you could read this proof. Okay, and then as a special case, just treat all the proximal operators like the identity, and you'll get the convergence rate of Newton's method. I think it's a very clean treatment. Okay, um, and the, the assumptions are essentially exactly the same as what we stated for Newton's method. Um, th this is the non-self-concordant uh, rates that we stated for Newton's method, just the kind of vanilla assumptions, which is that the um, Hessian of G has the lowest eigenvalue bounded by M and the largest eigenvalue bounded by L. And the Hessian itself is a Lipschitz operator with a parameter of M. And this prox is, okay, so this is now special, of course, to prox, but it's something like we assume for prox and gradient. This is assuming we can exactly evaluate the prox. So every time we go to, say, minimize something of this form, we have no approximation error. We get the exact evaluation of the scale of prox. So um, this theorem kind of has two parts. Uh, the first part of the proximal Newton method with backtracking line search, the one that I defined for you, you know, here. I'm sorry, I skipped past it. This came from the same paper. Uh, it has global convergence. Okay, so at least it, it converges globally. No matter where you start, it's going to converge. Uh, let's say the iterates xt will eventually converge to solution x star. And furthermore, there's a, a, a point k0. And I can't remember if, if this proof is as explicit about what that is in terms of the problem parameter as, as the proof in Boyd and Vandenberg, but I think it may be at least written there in the proof. There, there's an iteration number k0 after which we get local, after which we get quadratic convergence. Okay, so the, the, the difference in, uh, let's say, our iterate at step k to the solution in L2R is um, <coughs> like something times the square of the difference at step k minus 1. Okay, so that's called quadratic convergence. And because it only happens, let's say, after some point, right, it, we call it local quadratic convergence. When we're close enough to the solution, we get this very rapid convergence. Okay, so this is um, the local convergence rate, log, log, more rapid iteration. But of course, um, each iteration here uses a, uses a scale box evaluation. So, as I was emphasizing, this is even much more expensive than a Newton step. So think about, um, just remember that this is not at all reflective of somehow how many flops it would take or anything like that. We're just talking about iterations. And this can be very different for different problems. And generally, it just, it's quite expensive for problems. OK, let's see how I'm doing on time. Um, I was planning on going through a sketch of the proof. Yeah, maybe I'll just do that very quickly. Um, so to prove global convergence, uh, right. So this, the outline of this proof is actually somewhat similar to an outline of the proof in Boyd and Vandenberg. So to, to prove global convergence, uh, essentially all we have to do is prove that um, the backtracking exit criterion will be satisfied by some uh, step that's not zero. Okay, um, and then to essentially get sufficient progress 
at every iteration towards minimizing the criterion. Okay, and so that, that's uh, what's required to do here. And basically, we just have to plug this into the backtracking exit criterion and use these conditions in order to verify that backtracking will exit with such a step. Okay, very similar to what one would do to, um, in, in the non quadratic um, phase of Newton, in the damped phase of Newton's analysis. And then to prove local quadratic convergence again, uh, it suffices. To, um, so this is kind of what we did again with pure, uh, the regular Newton method. We proved that at some point, pure step size eventually satisfies uh, the backtracking exit condition. And then this is a, a very kind of, I think, a very nice, clean sequence of statements that um, these authors uh, recognize. If you want to look at the progress. Okay, at, step, at, at the next step, say x was done by x plus uh, towards you know, estimating the solution at x star, we can bound that by um, the same quantity but in the h norm, just by, by dividing by um, the lowest, uh, the square root of the lowest eigenvalue of the Hessian. Okay, this is just using a very, um, you know, this is just the definition of the lowest eigenvalue of the Hessian essentially. Essentially. Okay, and then once in the H norm, we can actually remember what this is. So we can write out that x plus Okay, we can actually write out that x plus minus x star in the H norm is the um, scale of prox in the H norm. Uh, when we evaluate it at a Newton step, okay? That's just using the definition of x plus. Another property of the proximal mapping that I didn't somehow explicitly state, but that they've proved in this paper, um, and it, it should kind of make sense to you, is that um, it gives you a fixed point iteration at the solution x star. So if we were at x star, and we were to try to take a new step and apply the scale proxima map, we'd get back x star. Okay, something you can prove just by the depth, by kind of simple optimality analysis with the scale <coughs> proxima operator, which, so, which means that I can always write x star as um, equal to what happens if we were to try to take a new step, right, and then apply the, the proxima operator. Okay, so that's, uh, sorry, this seems to come out kind of hard to read. Okay, and then now we can use uh, two facts. First, we can use non-expansiveness of the proxima operator. Okay, and then we can use Lipschitzness uh, of the of the Hessian. Okay, and once we apply both of those facts, this, and then we use the upper eigenvalue bound to pull out uh, yeah, the upper eigenvalue bound, we get exactly that right hand side. Okay, so there's just a couple more lines that are required here. If you're curious, I'm happy to you know, go through an office hour so we can take a look at the paper. I think it's a nice kind of clean proof. Okay, so that's, that's something to keep in mind about um, Proxima Newton. Um, and I wanted to point out kind of two uh, notable instances of uh, Proxima Newton in the literature. So one is this uh, software package written in Fortran called Glinda. Um, it's for L1 penalized generalized linear models. So things like logistic regression criterion plus an L1 penalty. Or just more generally, it's for generalized linear models plus separable penalties. And the inner problems are solved using four percent. Okay, so we make cross uh steps, and we solve those inner problems using quarter descent. And this has a nice connection to, um, you know, like some old stuff in statistics because to solve generalized linear models, typically in statistics, we, we learn the newton raphson method, which as you saw in your homework, we, we think about applying Newton's method, which is nothing more than just kind of iteratively reweighting uh, the least squares criterion. So this is really a very similar thing, right? We, for, the, for the log likelihood part, we make a Newton uh, approximation it ends up looking like a weight of these squares, but then we have our penalty sitting around because right that, that was the h function that's been sitting around. And so we have something like an L1 penalized weight of these squares, 
and uh, that's typically solved with quarter percent. At least that's what this, this package does. And another um, kind of well-known one is this quick package that came from uh, some folks at UT Austin uh, that is a really fast, so this is extremely fast for its purpose, so it's quick. This is a really fast way of, of uh, solving the graphical lasso. So it, it uses Fox from Newton in a very clever way. It recognizes that the Hessian in the graphical lasso problem can be uh, represented with a bunch of Kronecker products. So it uses a bunch of factorization tricks so it doesn't have to actually somehow treat the Hessian in a, in a uh, burdensome way. And again, it uses quarter percent for the inner problems. Because they all it ends, it reduces to a bunch of um, like lasso inner problems that are being solved with quarter percent. So these are very widely used. I just took a look at uh, Glimnet. This, this paper I think has like 4,000 citations. Um, so like for, for a paper about software, that's quite a lot. Um, and I think that they are pretty close to state of the art at the right scale. So we're talking about you know, optimizing problems that are so big that you know you can't fit the data in memory, these would not be used, but at the right scale, like on my laptop, I think these are pretty close to state of the art. Of course all this is debatable, right? This, you know, there may be other things that perform this as well that I'm not aware of. Um, okay, if we have time, I thought it would be fun for me to give you a bit more details about GlimNet, so let's just save, um, save that to the end if I end up having time. I'll give you some implementation uh, insights into GlimNet. So another note that I wanted to make, so apart from um, you know, needing to have a fast inner optimizer, which we do here, right, four percent. Another important note is that uh, Proxima Newton often uses far less evaluations of the gradient of G and of G itself than proximal gradient. Because each step makes so much more progress, you don't have to actually evaluate the gradient or the, uh, the function itself nearly as many times. Okay, and if, if it's actually for some reason expensive to evaluate the function g or its gradient, then that, that can also be a win for proximal gradient. Even though we're, we're kind of solving expensive inner optimization problems like this one, we only ever have to somehow evaluate g and its gradient once to get this, and it's Hessian. And then solving that's expensive, but it makes a lot of progress, and so in all in all, we don't actually end up evaluating g or its gradient very often. So here are some examples of. Um, proximal gradients on various problems, and this comes from this paper, same paper I was referencing earlier. So this is an example of L1 penalized logistic regression, and uh, here um, these authors implemented uh, proximal Newton, FISTA, which is uh, accelerated proximal gradient, and a, a, a spectral projected gradient method that we didn't learn called, um, I don't know how to pronounce that, Barca? I don't, I'm not really familiar with this method. Um, but uh, the comparison between proximal gradient and proximal Newton is at least one that we can understand. So, both in terms of function evaluations, right, and in terms of time. So here, here they implemented um, all methods, I think, in a common language. I think, I believe it was C. Um, we see that proximal Newton is doing really quite well for this uh, particular problem. And I don't even think they were using quarter percent as the inner optimizer. I believe in this problem they're actually using FISTA itself as the inner optimizer for the lasso problem. Right? Because for logistic regression, again, we reduce it to something like a sequence of lasso problems. Uh, to my knowledge, it's best, usually best to solve, solve those with quarter percent. And this is actually even just using FISTA for that inner problem. And still, you can see proximal Newton dominating. Um, I mean, in the good way. It's doing very well. So that the, uh, the computational cost here, uh, of evaluating G or its gradient is actually non-trivial because it's a very large problem and we kind of are either evaluating the exponential function or the log function several times. And each of these is much more expensive than a typical flop. Uh, so the author said that that's, that's actually part of the reason why Proxmoon is doing so well for this uh, logistic regression problem. And another example here, this is a much uh, larger problem where n is about 500,000 and t is about 6,000. Um, proximal Newton still does you know, quite well uh, by, according to both metrics. Okay? So let me just mention inexact prox evaluations and then I think we'll take a break. Um, so a very important point is that uh, we essentially always um, have inexact prox evaluations in practice with proximal Newton, which is not true with proximal gradient. 
Um, and you have to be somewhat careful about uh, to what degree you optimize the inner problem before you take the Newton step. So both proximal gradient and proximal Newton are somewhat finicky with, uh, in terms of inexact box valuations. But proximal Newton is a little bit worse, in my experience in practice, as to um, not being very robust. So if we exit early, like, let, let's suppose that we are in this situation. Okay, and we do proximal Newton, and then we have, we're faced with a lasso problem for the inner step, and we decide to run FISTA, because we learned FISTA is a good method for, um, you know, for, for optimizing the lasso problem. So we may think, well, let me just take 10 iterations. I'll just take 10 iterations and I'll stop, even though it's probably far from converging, because we know that you know, FISTA is a first order method. Even though it's accelerated, it's not going to get us probably that close to the solution in 10 iterations, but this is only one part of a bigger optimization problem, right? So it's tempting just to quit after 10 iterations and then expect to take a few more proximal Newton steps, maybe overall, but we'll save on the inner cost. So that actually is a fairly dangerous strategy uh, unless we're being kind of careful about um, optimizing the inner problem, uh, especially with proximal Newton. Um, you know, the safest, I, safest thing is just to optimize each inner problem to like a high degree of accuracy. But there are more clever ways to kind of quit. And that, that's, I think, one of the main contributions of this paper. Um, so they, they investigate in the context of the graphical lasso, another common problem which people use, Fox Newton. Different stopping rules for um, the inner optimizations. And so they have this one, which is they call it exact, which means just iterate until you get like convergence to a very, very high degree in the inner problem. They have one which should just take 10 iterations. That's uh, this green guy. And they have one which they call uh, adaptive. And this is a rule that they propose in this paper, which uh, basically offers you a stopping criterion for the inner iterations. When to stop optimizing the inner, inner iterations. And it appears to do very well in all the experiments in the paper. So here are, um, here's the, the kind of idea behind that inexact, uh, inexact rule. So, um, in, uh, in smooth problems, uh, sometimes you think about uh, right, sometimes we think about stopping rules uh, of this form. So, um, we, we let's suppose we didn't have any uh, non-smooth part at all to our criterion, uh, and let's note by the quadratic approximation to g, g tilde. Okay, about the point x k minus one, it's g tilde subscript k minus one. So just to be explicit, g tilde subscript k minus one at a point, let's say z, it's the quadratic approximation right, that we would make of this form. Okay, so. Uh, one common stopping rule for inexact minimization and smooth problems, in which we use quadratic approximations of this form, is to check whether the gradient of this function, the quadratic approximation, uh, at the new point, this is supposed to say, okay. So here, think about z being uh, xk, okay, at the next point. When it's uh, less than or equal to some um, some constant times uh, the gradient at the previous iteration. Okay, and this is this is called uh, the gradient of the full function of the previous iteration. This is called a forcing sequence. This sequence eta k. Okay, so something we didn't really talk about very much. We haven't talked about stopping criteria in great detail. We just kind of mentioned a few basic things, but this is a fairly common one for smooth optimization. So for proximal Newton, um, these authors advocate basically the same idea but replacing gradients everywhere you see them with generalized gradients. And one thing that I found a little bit funny when I read this paper is that I, I actually, um, you know, that they don't make it super clear where these come from. These are, as far as I understand, generalized gradients with respect to the unscaled props. Okay, so the usual notion of generalized gradients that you learned back when we saw proximal gradient. So for the unscaled props, Right, if we have um, just the proximal operator associated with a function, let's call it h, and we would apply x minus t times the gradient of g, 
Remember, the generalized gradient is defined so that this is true, so that we can write that in this step. This guy, we define so that this relationship holds. So we can think about these proxy gradient updates as a descent, as some kind of, uh, you know, descent method where this is the descent direction. So this is what I'm talking about here. That's these generalized gradients here. Okay, so we basically evaluate the generalized gradient with respect to the unscaled box, which we typically could compute in closed form. And we stop the inner optimization when this is true for some particular forcing sequence A to K. And they actually recommend this forcing sequence itself. That's what's used in, the, in these, all these uh, pictures here. It's, that's the blue rule called adaptive. And I think a very neat part, uh, part of this paper is they, they prove that actually inexact Pops and Newton has a local superlinear rate. So if you use this rule exactly under the same conditions I already showed you, the, the conversions, the local convergence is superlinear, and it still has global convergence. Okay, so it's a pretty strong guarantee that's associated with them. Um, inexact like this. And, okay, I said I'd say one more thing and take a break. I'll just, I'll really just do this last thing, then I'll take a break. It'll be a very good spot to take a break. So, proximal quasi Newton is also an option. Um, you know, it relates very much to, to this, so inexact box value uh, evaluations. Uh, so there's some very nice uh, kind of discussion in this paper about how to do that. Uh, and of course they go with like PFGS type stuff, um, and they have very good empirical performance, and they also have local superlinear convergence. So this paper considers a bunch of very practical issues, like what happens if you use a PFGS update for the Hessian, uh, say in, you know, in the scale procs, and you evaluate um, that inner optimization, and exactly, you still get local superlinear convergence. Okay, and it's, uh, it performs very well in practice. And then I, there's this other very nice paper that I've um, come across several times by a, a legend in optimization who's you know, sadly passed away, Paul Sang, who considers, a, I think, a very interesting way for doing proximal quasi newton or you may call it that. Um, and his idea is to basically take proximal Newton steps in blocks of variables and rotate through which blocks you're looking at. So you just look at the Hessian of some group of variables, um, form a quadratic approximation just in those variables, and then take a step, and then rotate around which block you're looking at. So that only works when this H function is, uh, right, when this function here, is separable among those groups of variables. So when it's a function of one group plus another, plus another, etc. But those situations, you know, they, they do pop up quite commonly. And the advantage of this method, which um, I think is somewhat underappreciated uh, versus kind of usual proximal Newton or making quasi Newton updates to the full Hessian, is that you only ever need small Hessians, right? Because you're only ever making approximations to Hessians in a, a subgroup of variables. Um, so this can be much more efficient if you kind of set up the right way in practice. And they prove that this method has linear convergence. So global linear convergence, which I think is a very strong property. Okay, and then of course, um, one more thing to mention is that uh, these quadrant updates can also be helpful when the Hessian is ill-conditioned, not just when it's expensive or burdensome to carry around or convert. Also helps a lot kind of keeping the problem well conditioned. Okay, we kind of flew through proximal Newton there. I have a bit of time to talk about projected Newton or about um, Limnet. We can decide after a short break. So let's just take a short break. I don't know, maybe a little bit over 15 minutes. Um, so let me ask first, are there any questions about proximal Newton? We did go through that kind of quickly. Um, any questions about the way the method works or the assumptions we made for anything? or Practical issues people are wondering about. OK. Um, so how about I, I'll start with projected Newton. I don't think we, ha we really have kind of too much detail to go into anyways. And then um, hopefully I'll have a little bit of time and I can tell you about um, something called active set optimization uh, that's, or I mean, that, that term is maybe used too loosely, but it, it's something that Glimnet does and a lot of other um, implementations do that really uh, can make a very big difference in terms of practical conversions. So 
let's, like I said, first talk about Project and Newton. So what's wrong with uh, kind of the usual notion of Project and Newton? We're going to see a, a notion of Project and Newton that's kind of really quite different than what you might have thought, which is do a Newton step and project onto the constraint set. Um, and it helps to go back to um, just our proximal Newton algorithm. So let's suppose we had an optimization problem of this form, minimizing g subject to, man, this is full of typos, I'm sorry. It's supposed to say x in c, um, subject to x in c. And remember that proximal gradient in this case reduces to projected gradient. We saw that because the proximal operator, so we write this first as, um, you know, minimize g of x plus the indicator of x being the set c. And this becomes our function h. For such a function h, its proximal operator, in the usual sense, is just the projection onto the set c. So proximal gradient descent reduced to projected gradient descent, which is a nice kind of uh, relationship with these first order methods. Proximal Newton doesn't reduce to projected Newton. Okay, it's, if we were to um, you know, write it like this, and then thinking about applying, uh, let's say, the scaled proximal operator to the Newton step with respect to g, it's not just projection onto c. It's because the scaled proximal operator um, has kind of a much more complicated, uh, it, it, gets, it has a much more complicated relationship with this constraint set in the minimization. So we can just see that. So this is the scaled proximal operator at the Newton step, right? Um, we look at the point called z plus that minimizes the Newton step with respect to g at the point x minus z in the scaled h norm subject to z being in the set uh, c. But it's this h norm that gives us so much trouble. OK, if this was a 2 norm, if that was a 2 norm, then this would be exactly project the Newton step onto the set C. But it's not, right? Remember, this is actually the H norm. And when we expand it, it looks like this. Okay, so it's, it's the quadratic approximation to G around the point X in the Hessian, using the Hessian here. And that optimization, right, optimizing this kind of generic quadratic over a set C is not the same thing as minimizing this quadratic and projecting onto the set C. OK, so this is not a projection in general. And it's, uh, it's quite expensive to compute. Also in general, it's, I mean, it, this, is a, this is a QP, right? And depending on what C is, this doesn't need to be cheap at all. This could be kind of quite expensive. So the hope of taking a Newton step and then projecting onto the constraint sets is kind of dashed. Um, you may have seen that coming, right? If that wasn't true, you might ask, why do, why do we need things like the barrier method? Right? If, like, even for the non-negative orthant, we use the barrier method. Right? So projection onto the, onto the non-negative orthant is uh, quite simple. Why don't we just take a Newton step and then project onto the non-negative orthant? It's because that's not a valid method so far as we know yet. Okay? Um, I mean, of course, interior point methods are useful for other reasons. But it would have been simpler to first learn something like take a Newton step and then project. Right? That would have been something simpler to learn. But that's not something that people do in general, because it doesn't work in general. But it works in some cases, and that's um, what we're going to see now. So w when we have box constraints, so if our constraint set is of this form, okay, these are just uh, coordinate-wise coordinate constraints on our variable x, which you can think of as being constraining x to lie in a box, then um, Projection Newton can be made to work, but it requires some modification to, uh, to the method. And this is a nice, very nice paper by uh, Britsekis. Did this back in the, in the 80s, and then it got picked up more recently uh, among some machine learning circles uh, where it had some kind of revival. So this is the problem we're thinking about. OK, minimize a function g that's you know, convex and smooth, say twice differentiable. Um, subject to box constraints. And the projected Newton method, um, it does do a Newton step and then project, but it does it in a very special way. And it first defines something called the binding set. Okay? These are the coordinates of our current iterate that are close to the boundary. So 
within, let's say, epsilon of the lower boundary or within epsilon of the upper boundary. So these are the coordinates of our, of our current iterate that are close to the boundary of the box. Right? Imagine we have some box in n dimensions, which I can only draw in three. And imagine that you know, our, our iterate's lying like right up here. Okay, so it's lying close to, let's say, the boundary of the box. So it's close to, it's, it's uh, bigger than or equal to ui, which is the upper bound minus epsilon. And not only that, not only that, but uh, if we were to take a gradient step, simple gradient step, um, we would also be pushed further towards the boundary. Okay, so a gradient step would not move us into the interior. It would just push us further towards the boundary. So that these things, uh, they're close to the boundary and they're kind of meant to lie in the boundary because the next, the next step would not move them in the inside. That's, what's, that's what this is saying here. The gradient in the ith component is positive or the gradient in the ith component is negative. Okay, so if we were to move in the direction of the negative gradient, we would only make this bigger or we'd only make that smaller. Okay, so that's called the binding set. And uh, as you might guess, we don't actually touch the binding set when we do optimization. We look at what's called the free set. It's the uh, complement. So we take all the components of our optimization variable that aren't close to the boundary, and we def define the free set accordingly. So these are all the things that are on the inside, or, or they're on the boundary, and they'd be moved towards the inside with a gradient step. And um, then we look at the Hessian just in that free set. So we just look at the Hessian, uh, the principal submatrix of the Hessian, which means just the rows and columns that correspond to this free set. Okay, so it's a smaller Hessian. Think about like reducing optimization problems just being one over these variables, not touching the binding set. And then inverting the Hessian, okay, th this like smaller subblock of the Hessian, call that uh, SK. And then we perform, this looks complicated, but it's really not. We just perform a Newton step in those variables, okay, and the other variables we don't touch. Okay, we don't touch at all, which reduces to a gradient step in those other variables. But by how they're defined, right, a gradient step's gonna only leave them on the boundary. So essentially, what this is saying is, just update xk by a Newton step over the free set. Don't touch it at all over the binding set. Then project it um, onto the box. Okay, so we could write this differently by saying we take um, you know, xk minus 1 in the free set, free set of variables, and we take, uh, sorry, we take a Newton step in this. So we take this matrix, which I think I called S k minus 1 times the gradient in the free set. Okay, so that, that's going to be our kind of our, um, suppose we were to define an intermediate variable called Z uh, k. So over the free variables, we, let's say we define it to be a Newton step in those variables. And over the, the binding set, we just take what we had before. We don't do any update at all. Case is equivalent to what I have in the slides. Just take what we have before, don't do any update at all. Leave them as they were. So they're going to stay on the, on the boundary of the box. And then we take this z, this z variable, and xk is gotten by projecting onto this box. So this, is, this just means all points that are between L and U component-wise. Right? And projection onto a box is very simple. At, in every component, we just, if something's larger than, say, ui, we push it to ui. If it's smaller than li, we push it to li. Otherwise, we don't touch it. So this projection is like just a bunch of very simple checks. Okay, and the nice thing about projected Newton as we've defined it here is that um, let's suppose we have like a very uh, big dimension for optimization problem, n is very large, and uh, it so happens that at the solution many variables lie in the boundary, then we're, at some point we're going to be optimizing kind of over very small sets of variables. Okay, just very small sets of variables, and because this binding set's going to grow large and we're not going to touch it across iterations.
So uh, there's some very nice work on this, as I said. Um, Bert Sackis has the first paper, as far as I'm aware, and he proves that uh, under kind of standard assumptions, um, this method projected Newton will identify the proper binding constraints in some number of iterations. So it's just going to get the right binding constraints, the, one that are, the ones that are there at the solution. So at the solution, let's suppose that you know, x star lay on some face of the box, so it, it was equal to ui or li in a bunch of components. Projection Newton's going to identify that. Once it identifies that, it's going to leave that untouched. right? It's never going to change that from then out. And it's just going to be Newton's method on the remaining variables. So at that point, it's going to have local quadratic conversions. Um, he also proves that uh, the method has superlinear global convergence. Okay, so it converges very fast uh, globally as well. And then there's the usual you can use instead of uh, the Hessian, like a BFGS style update. So you can do projected quasi Newton, and then these papers discuss convergence properties when you do that. Okay, so it can be very efficient, a very efficient method if you have optimization problems with box constraints. And what, what optimization problems meant box constraints, I wrote down a bunch of them here. It's actually more than you think. One notable one, for example, let's say, is the SVM dual. You guys derived that uh, on the homework, or we did in lecture a bunch of times. The SVM dual is, is a box constrained QP. Um, projected Newton's actually quite efficient for that problem. Um, but there's a bunch of other ones I wrote down here. OK, so that was projected Newton. Now I have five minutes, it looks like, to do just a quick overview of Glimnet. Any questions about projected Newton? OK, so it's a very, I'm going to give you um, an overview of some implementation tricks that are used in Glimnet, but they're really very simple. They're just maybe worth pointing out. So let's suppose we're looking to optimize a problem of this form, which is um, kind of a common problem form. I just mixed notation there, sorry. I'll call beta the optimization variable because I'm thinking about G being a, a, like a non-negative, sorry, a, a, a negative log likelihood function. So let's actually write this like this. Okay, let's write it as L of some matrix X times beta plus lambda times the L and of beta. Okay, so let's suppose this is our problem. OK, and what uh, I, I had claimed Glimnet does is make quadratic approximations to this and then solve the inner problems via coordinate descent. But it, it does it uh, in a particular way. And there's kind of a few aspects to be aware of. Um, the first is that it solves the problem. This is a very common thing. So you know, it's not like this is unique to Glimnet at all. And neither is really what I'm, the other active set optimization method I'm about to describe but they're both important to point out. So let's solve over a sequence of lambdas. That actually is going to help quite a bit. So we're going to solve this over a problem of lambda values. And this is the interesting part. Even if you just wanted the solution, let's say, at one value of lambda, like lambda equals 5, Glimnet will still solve it over a sequence of lambdas. Okay, even if you didn't care about the solutions for other values of, of of the tuning parameter lambda, it'll still get there by solving a, a, what's called pathwise optimization, because it can do so much more effectively than direct optimization at one value of lambda. OK, so th this is often helpful for statistical purposes, just because like, we're looking at this path of solutions. But even if you didn't care about that, you just wanted the solution at a kind of moderately small value of lambda, we still would do this pathwise optimization. And we're going to start with a big value first. And that's important, you'll see, for the following reason. So the first thing we do before we do any quadratic approximations or anything else is that we actually write down the KKT conditions. I mean, the software doesn't. We just think about it this way. Right? The software thinks about essentially enumerating the KKT conditions. And um, I'm going to write them like this for you. OK, um, let's suppose that L is the logistic regression loss, just to keep things concrete. Okay, the, if you write in the KKT conditions for this problem, I'm going to write them down coordinate-wise. 
they look like this. Um, right. So this thing is equal to uh, lambda times s1 all the way through x. Let's say, let's say um, the dimension of the optimization problem is p. OK, so you can check that for yourself, that these are the KKT conditions. Or this is just the subgradient optimality conditions. I'm just using that word interchangeably. Where p of beta, uh, say, in the ith component, is um, 1 over 1 plus e to the x beta in the ith component minus. So this is the predicted probability at the ith observation of seeing a 1. Okay, these, th these are the KKT conditions. And here, uh, these S's are subgradients of the opposite value of beta. So S1 is a subgradient of the opposite value of beta 1. Okay, so what we do is we, we uh, start, let's say at lambda equals 1 and beta equals 0. So we, we imagine the, the solutions can be beta equals 0, which will be true when, when lambda is large enough. So we plug in beta equals 0, and then we basically pass through each of these um, conditions and take inner products. So we take the inner product of just the x's with y's. And if these inner products, let's say, are smaller than lambda in absolute value, we first determine okay, um, that that variable is probably going to be inactive at the solution. So we define the active set to be the set of, let's say, um, variables j between 1 through p, such that xj transpose y minus beta uh, p beta 0, our initial point, is larger or equal to lambda in absolute value. Because if it was smaller than lambda, I guess I should have maybe mentioned this, but we've done this kind of stuff before. If it was smaller than lambda, then by definition of the subgrain, that can only mean that beta was 0 at the solution. Okay, if, if, if we were at the solution and we looked at the KKT conditions, if this inner product was smaller than lambda, that forces the corresponding s to be smaller than 1. Okay, smaller than lambda in absolute value. It forces s to be smaller than 1 absolute value, which forces, by the definition of the subgradient, that value of beta to be, to be 0 at the solution. So what we do is we first try to guess the zeros at the solution by looking at just the magnitudes of these inner products. Then we do, this is where the kind of um, big gain comes. We do proximal Newton, but only on the variables in A. So we pretend like everything else is 0 at the solution. We set them to 0, and we make the quadratic approximation, and we do coordinate descent or whatever else we're going to do after that on a much smaller problem, just the variables in A. And because we started with a large lambda, the kind of direction of the path is that this, this set's going to be quite small at the start. OK, so then upon convergence, we recheck the KKT conditions. even though it's okay. And we see if we had any failures. So now we go back to this kind of long list of conditions, right? Of course, the ones that correspond to the variables in A should be satisfied because we just optimize over that. But we go back and check all of them. If any variables sat, uh, fail their KKT ch check, then we just add them back to A. and repeat. So let's suppose we ran the KKT conditions check. We had thousands of variables. And some that we thought were out, outside of A initially actually failed the KKT condition check, okay, which means that this inner product was larger than lambda, even though we had deemed it to be 0 in the initial pass. We add it back to A, and then we rerun proximal Newton. Okay, then we, we just do whatever else we we're going to be doing on that, on that smaller problem. And we repeat this until. We meet all the KKT conditions. Usually this takes a couple passes. Then we move to the next value of lambda. And this is the kind of beauty of these, uh, the, these pathwise optimizations. We're already at a point where the KKT conditions are very close to being satisfied approximately, right? Because of the stability of this solution as we change the tuning parameter. So we basically already have a pretty good guess of what A is going to be, the, uh, the non-zero set, so that we, again, don't have to somehow run uh, 
very many passes through these, um, through these iterations here. And by the time we get to, let's say, a small value of lambda, we have, again, a pretty good guess at what the active set should be. So Proclam Newton on that set actually does pretty well. So this is the strategy used by Glimnet. This combined with something called screening rules, which we didn't talk about, and I may talk about it as an advanced topic, means that uh, it kind of only ever has to solve very small problems at any one given point in the algorithm. Um, yeah, OK, I'm over time. That was it. Uh, see you guys on Wednesday. Oh, and vote tomorrow. Remember to vote tomorrow.